My name's Doug Pine. I work with the team at b and &E Enterprise in supporting the growth and development for companies and their suppliers at Brisbane Airport. We're very grateful for the opportunity to work with Brisbane Marketing on what will be an important initiative, helping to navigate our stakeholders out of this current coronavirus situation. I'd like to recognise uh, both Gert Jan de Graaf, our CEO at Brisbane Airport, and Brett Fraser, the CEO of Brisbane Marketing, for recognising the importance of launching this vital exercise in determining the best way forward in helping business and industry to maximise global export opportunities from Queensland. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Brisbane Marketing's Andrew Davison and Lisa Cavallaro um, with uh, Brisbane Marketing's Industrial Investment and Investment Industry Development Division, as well as Corey Heathwood, uh, Brisbane Airport's Head of Government, Industry and Community Relations and Public Affairs. They've also played a, a, a critical role in, uh, in organising uh, today's guests and, uh, and moderator, Stephen Sylvester. The format for today's webinar will be quite fluid. Um, I'll be introducing our guests to Brisbane Marketing's General Manager for Investment and Industry Development, Stephen Sylvester, who's been kind enough to lead and moderate the discussion with our guest speakers for today. Brisbane Airport's Head of Aviation Development, Mr. Carl Jones, and Port of Brisbane Chief Operating Officer, Peter Kite. Following the discussion, we'll take questions from our guests to ask Carl and Peter. Please take the opportunity to ask a question by using the Q&A function on the Zoom application. Either Stephen or I will then uh, hand your questions over to our two guest speakers. Uh, I'll now hand you over to our moderator for today's discussion, Stephen Sylvester. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Doug. And look, welcome everyone to this, uh, this webinar today. We, uh, we want this to be an interactive process. And so after the opening remarks, we are really interested to get questions from, from you, the audience, but I hope you're all well and staying healthy and, and safe during this um, challenging time we're facing at the moment. And can I just start by welcoming um, everyone and acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today and um, where I'm hosting this meeting and also pay my respects to elders past, present and, and emerging as well. Uh, as Doug mentioned, my name's Stephen Sylvester. I'm the General Manager of Investment and Industry Development for the City's Economic Development Board, Brisbane Marketing. And uh, it's, it's my, my honour to be here today to support this, this webinar and, and hear from Peter and, and Carl. Um, can I first say that we, we, we acknowledge that for, for many of those in the audience, it's a, an incredibly tough time. And this uh, opportunity today to, to ask questions and look to you know, two important pieces of infrastructure that this city has that are going to be critical to our recovery uh, is an important topic. Uh, from the perspective of our role in the city as Brisbane Marketing, we work very closely with the, the, the Lord Mayor, uh, Adrian Schrinner, as well as the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Krista Adams, and we uh, continue to work on um, opportunities and responses for recovery as well. Um, the, the city and the city council have launched a number of initiatives so far as a response to the pandemic, waiving charges and rents and levies for a range of businesses, uh, introducing seven day payment terms, um, introducing a renewed commitment to buy local as well. And so there's a, a number of efforts around to, to help with the recovery and support local businesses. But today, we're looking to this piece of uh, these pieces of infrastructure that support our export orientated industries. We, we know that uh, for many other cities around the world, um, these, those without these pieces of infrastructure would certainly have, um, you know, be behind the eight ball when it comes to the recovery efforts. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the true approach of collaboration and coordination that we have. This, this discussion today has come off the back of a number of discussions with, the, um, with a number of working groups out of the state government, particularly the work that Charles Burke's been doing within the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, and working with industry, as well as Matthew Andrews, the General Manager of Queensland Operations for Trade and Investment Queensland. I know they have been working tirelessly on their working groups um, that we're a part of and working with industry and also the industry associations that have been providing such critical feedback to the airport and the port on um, challenges and also opportunities. Uh, those like the Meat and Livestock Australia, Growcom, Seafood Trade Advisory Group and uh, Food Industry Association of Queensland. We've got a very close working relationship on a range of programs that we deliver. So look, 
without further ado, um, I, I do want to sort of um, move into the discussion. Um, from Brisbane Marketing's perspective, we've been looking at a whole range of, of different programs, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this discussion, some of the upcoming um, work and priority programs that we're working through our uh, Future Food Initiative on. <clears throat> and, um, and we do wish this sort of whole um, uh, webinar series to, to become a bit of a quarterly, and we'll, t we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, please address your, your questions in, in the chat, um, and Doug and I will endeavour to ask as many of those to, to Peter and Carl. Uh, they've assured us that, uh, that nothing is out of bounds at the moment, so we, we can test them on that. Um, but if I can start, I might um, just hand over to, to Carl to just start with some opening remarks, and then we'll move on to, to Peter from there. So, Carl, do you want to just um, give us a bit of an outline of where Brisbane Airport is at the moment, um, Brisbane Airport Corporation, uh, some of those some of those challenges that have presented themselves through the the pandemic, as well as you know some of the opportunities and some of the the recovery that we know is is starting there. So, I'll hand over to Carl. Thanks, Carl. Great. Thanks, Stephen, and um, thank you for everybody for joining. Uh, we're, we're really pleased to be part of this webinar. And um, as Stephen and uh, Doug have mentioned, there's been a lot of um, discussions and work and, and, and um, conversations with governments, Brisbane marketing, industry. Um, so, so this is really um, a, a very exciting opportunity to talk with so many, or well, talk and, and share insights with so many. Um, from Brisbane Airport's perspective, obviously, like many businesses, we've had significant impact, not, not, not surprising, uh, from COVID-19. Um, essentially, losing 90% of our flights in, in, in really, uh, um, really quickly. So as a business, I mean, uh, focusing on that and, and what do we need to focus on in terms of recovery, both immediate, but, but also longer term. And freight's been a big part of that, freight and exports. So for us, uh, what, what that 90% drop meant, um, a lot of our scheduled passenger services disappearing. Um, but but as, we, as we progress through the, the COVID-19 and the bottoming out, um, freight and exports, imports um, has, has in some ways never been busier. Um, with, with, with such a reduction in flights. So um, in terms of industry, freight forwarders, airlines responding to, to the need to keep freight flowing, um, what that's uh, meant um, has an increase, I guess, in ad hoc freight flights. So uh, what started with uh, um, a great initiative by the federal government um, in introducing the International Freight Assistant Mechanism, um, which allowed uh, cooperation across the country with airlines, with, with industry and exports to, to get freight moving. Um, so we've been a beneficiary of that, but uh, along with the federal government's support for keeping the, the networks flowing domestically. So Qantas and Virgin have continued to fly domestically to keep things moving. Um, in March, we saw just over 40 freight dedicated flights on passenger aircraft. In April, uh, sorry, uh, in March, yeah, in April that, that increased to just over 60. So we're still seeing some flights uh, humming along. Um, this is in addition to some of the airlines continue to fly. It hasn't all been bad news. So the likes of Air New Zealand, um, some of the Pacific carriers, uh, New Guinea, um, Air Nauru, um, and the Taiwanese carriers continuing scheduled service, which has been good. But we've also seen these ad hoc freight flights uh, from the lights of obviously Qantas and Virgin, but uh, Singapore Airlines, Cathay, Emirates, um, and a number of others. So, so there has been some business moving. Um, but in us turning our attention to what more can we do from Brisbane Airport and, and working with the lights of Brisbane Marketing and Government and others uh, to, to really maximise that flight, we've, we've um, been speaking to a lot of people. And um, from, our, from our perspective, um, obviously flights are limited, but the... I guess the mantra that every flight, every piece of freight, every passenger is really important to our business, but also the 400 odd businesses and 24,000 jobs that are around our, our uh, ecosystem, um, but obviously the broader economy as well. Um, and it's really been about what Stephen mentioned, collaboration. So collaboration with the airlines, um, exporters, industry associations, uh, and the opportunity that we see, we, we have conversations with our, all our airlines ongoing, um, and whilst freight is, and exports are continuing to move, um, there has been um, the openness from airlines to say, if there are more opportunities, if there are exports that aren't moving, um, please do let us know. So that was really the impetus for us to, to engage with the likes of Stephen and the Brisbane marketing team 
uh, government and industry association. And, and what we found is that whilst the supply chain um, from exporters to freight forwarders to airlines is still working along, there, there seemed to be an opportunity to help uh, complement and supplement uh, what was going on, um, particularly when uh, we see the likes of Melbourne and Sydney have a higher rate of, of, uh, of flights. So um, what became clear to us is there was, there was someone up an opportunity to play a matchmaker role, um, trying to identify the demand or the interest from airlines for more, for more freight flights. Um, and then the challenges with exporters to, you know, with markets that have dried up or shifted, um, how, do, how do we try and uh, play a role without complicating the role of freight forwarders and acknowledging the important role that they play? So for us, um, we've, we've really keen today to, to answer any questions, engage with industry on, off the back of all the other discussions. But in terms of um, having two lenses on it, um, I think for our business, and I know many others, um, with a lot of business drying up, there's an immediate need and immediate opportunity to try and match um, perhaps exports that aren't moving, um, given 90% of those flights have disappeared. But with airlines wanting to plan and try and introduce um, additional flights, it's a bit of a chicken and egg um, opportunity, particularly given um, the lead time perhaps needed uh, to, make, to, to, to keep those moving. So, so we, we're really keen to hear today questions, answer, if we can help um, share information, help play a role in consolidating information, that'd be great. Um, but obviously that immediate and short-term focus will help our businesses start the recovery, um, and particularly over the next six months. One, one important, um, important point I think for us is also acknowledging uh, that as many commentators have said, the aviation recovery is gonna take you know, possibly up to three to four years uh, to return to what 2019 levels were. So if, if, if doing a good job short and immediate term can help uh, sustain and uh, generate important you know, revenue for exporters and ourselves and airlines, um, that, that groundwork will also help set a platform for the, the medium term and the, the, the recovery that's gonna take place over, over future years. So in 2021, if an airline is considering returning at three a week um, or five a week um, with good freight flows and exports that can soon become five a week and daily and beyond. So, so this is an important initiative for us, short term and, and medium term. And, and really, as I said, it's not about Brisbane Airport trying to play um, a role of a freight forwarder or, or, or any other part of the supply chain. It really is how do we complement and supplement uh, the roles that are already existing. Um, and some examples, you know, how, how do we all work together to try and identify the, the export demand that might be out there, aggregate um, that demand and letting, letting the freight forwarders and, and, and airlines know if that sits outside their normal conversations and business. So, so again, we're really excited um, to be involved in this, this webinar and, and ongoing through the, the people on this uh, webinar and, uh, and beyond, you know, the conversations of, you know, how can we provide that information to airlines how can we work to support exporters that are looking for places to put their, put their business? Excellent, Carl. And, and just, um, I know, Carl, you've, um, Brisbane Airport's uh, just sort of in the final phases of completing the second runway as well. Did you want to just maybe touch on that as well? I know um, capacity isn't our, our current issue in terms of the runway, but maybe just tell the people yeah. out there a little bit about that, that future as well and, and what that opportunity will be. Yeah, now the, great, the great thing of being part of an airport where you have capacity ahead of demand coming back, obviously a lot of it's dried up, but uh, we, the, the, the runway is essentially complete. Um, there's just some final um, in terms of operations and, and, and lighting, testing and, and such. But um, July 12, um, we're looking at potentially, or well, mid-July potentially to, to launch and open that runway. Um, so we're, we're obviously in preparations for um, when we're able to um, confirm and make that make that happen, um, but but for us it's a really strong symbol of we're open for business. So when when borders do lift, when uh, flights do return, we've got plenty of capacity to to really ramp up that recovery and, and welcome new flights. And obviously um, having freedom to be able to operate when airlines want to, um, that that's really exciting for us. And, and from one, I guess, private sector investor that's built out the capacity for our airport to, to another 
and Peter with you and the, the team at Port of Brisbane. Um, <clears throat> obviously investing for the future and having created the, the capacity in the asset for um, a, you know, a huge amount of ongoing traffic to the, to the port. Um, I might hand over to you now to just talk a little bit about what, what Port of Brisbane is experiencing at the moment, um, where, where you're seeing issues and challenges, and then you know, talking to the audience a little bit about those, those opportunities and, and information that you're seeing a little bit ahead, ahead of what we might see um, as the general business community. Over to you, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to the audience today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that this is National Reconciliation Week. So uh, we also would like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land and the waters on which Port of Brisbane operates and uh, acknowledge the, uh, the eldest past president and emerging. Um, Stephen, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, one, one thing we, we need to understand is a bit of the history of the port. It was very visionary by previous state governments to uh, set up the port here at Fisherman Island and indeed operate it in, a, in an area where it continues to grow and provide strength uh, to Brisbane and Queensland and the broader economy. Um, it was proven during the 2008 GFC how resilient uh, the port can be, mainly because of the diversity of cargoes that we handle. But indeed, this, this event is similar in, in part nature, but a very different event to, um, to handle going forward. And, and what we need to remember is that um, we're actually in economic headwinds prior to COVID-19. Uh, we experienced uh, a huge drought in this part of the world that had a major impact on exports and the agriculture sector. We went through the bushfires and now we're going through COVID-19. Now, it may not affect us as badly as what, say, Brisbane Airport, and our, our, um, our thoughts go out to uh, our cousins over there at the airport. They've been very badly impacted. But <clears throat> equally, the port is now seeing the effects of what, what we see as a recession evolving. We just don't know how long or how deep. Um, and that will have an impact right across the broader economy. And there are things that an infrastructure asset like the port can do to assist in, in weathering that uh, storm. But to just give you a, a quick idea of what happened, particularly from February, um, we've <coughs> had to work very hard to keep the port open. So we've had to work with all of the stakeholders, including the stevedores, including the unions, the regulators, governments, transport operators, freight forwarders, exporters, et cetera to ensure that we protect the safety of everyone, first and foremost, but also to ensure we keep the supply chain open. And, uh, and we've been able to do that um, without, um, without too many glitches to date, but um, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes by all of those stakeholders to make that happen. We, we experienced an extreme downturn in late February and March because of the China shutdown. And when we remember that 26% of our trade is China related, and indeed imports are up around 40% from China, that has a massive impact on supply chain tr through the port. Some may even say it sparked the infamous toilet paper run. But, um, you know, there were certainly uh, goods locked up and not able to uh, get to market during that period. Then we saw China coming back, but at the same time, other sectors throughout Southeast Asia, Europe, US, going into uh, also lockdowns that impacted trade. And while some of those are starting to recover, we're still floating around that 20% below normal uh, trade operations as we sit here today. <clears throat> it's very hard to predict how long that will last because there are multiple factors at play here and both uh, supply and demand driven. So supply in, in terms of closure of some ports or countries and demand from uh, a global uh, recessionary outlook. And um, that's impacting on, on things that are particularly attached to discretionary expenditure and consumer confidence. Things like motor vehicles, absolutely in the doldrums at the moment. Things like um, goods that you may not necessarily consider essential. Uh, they're not being purchased. So consumer confidence is impacting on trade. And indeed the port, what we see here tends to translate into the economy 
in the next three to six months. So we are very much a window to, to those economic conditions. Um, we are seeing some recession, but we're also seeing some optimism to be able to bounce back. Um, some sectors won't, tourism, travel, indeed we'll feel that effect with our cruise terminal being completed at the moment, but other sectors will come back with some strength, we believe. Um, having said that, um, we've got a long way to go. Uh, there's a lot to do to make sure that the port plays its part. And indeed, we've been doing that by trying to support our customers. Uh, we've announced a price freeze for all, trade, uh, all port charges for the next financial year ahead. So we're gonna maintain prices rather than uh, do any price review in order to support our customers and give us uh, give some certainty to the market for, for future planning. And we, we're, we're looking at what infrastructure we can invest in to help stimulate the economy. And, and we firmly believe we need stronger partnerships now more than ever uh, with the private sector and government to uh, stimulate the economy in that infrastructure space and indeed create jobs. I'm happy later on to talk about specific commodity sectors, uh, if you want me to, um, can share some data, some information on, on various other commodities that move through the port. And of course, here in Brisbane, we are the most diverse port in the country, uh, having to handle every um, cargo that you can imagine in the one location. So we have a lot of information, happy to share that and um, participate further in the webinar as you see fit. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Peter. And um... Look, we were having a chat um, the other day in preparation for today's discussion and, and you talked a little bit about some of the things that the Port of Brisbane have been doing, um, you know, as part of part of your response to this, you were talking about some of the, the movements you've made on on um, on costs and fees for the port. Do you want to maybe touch on some of those sort of um, pieces that you've put in place? Yeah, sure. Um... Look, we, we sat down with our board and we had a very um, heartfelt discussion about what the our customers, the, the broader community uh, expectations are of a major infrastructure infrastructure asset like the port. And, uh, and we could see the pain out there that was being felt and will continue to be felt for some time. So we um, did elect to freeze our prices. So we would traditionally align our pricing mechanisms to a CPI type outcome based on whatever the CPI may have been at the end of December last year. Um, we've elected not to put up our prices um, uh, on that ratio for the 12 months ahead and work with customers who are in um, pain and see what else we can do to assist. So working with our tenants, working with the, the transport sector, looking at what else we can do to improve efficiency or support them to get through this period uh, because we want them to be there when we come up uh, good again. Uh, we don't want them to fail and have to find new customers or new business further down the track. So that's been very important to us. Uh, we've reached out as, uh, to as many customers as we can to see what else we can do to support them. Fantastic, Peter. And, and you know, again, another example of how Queensland businesses are leading the way in Australia. But um, look, there's a question from Leanne Cruz. Uh, Leanne, hopefully I've pronounced your last name correctly, but from Leanne, just um, do you want to maybe touch on the, the ag and commodity breakdown that you just talked about as, as we sort of move forward? We'll st let's start with that anyway. Peter, just uh, maybe you can just update us on the, the agriculture oh, and commodity breakdown you were talking sure. about. Let's yeah, launch sure. into that. Um, so, so let's talk about agriculture. So uh, very much um, in, in a lot of pain over the last two years with drought conditions. And of course, we've had some reasonable rain earlier uh, this year and late last year to enable planting to occur for a harvest coming up around October. Now, um, we anticipate that that will translate into export cargoes. And there is certainly demand out there for that cargo. I'll put, put aside barley and the, and the China issues there, but there will be other markets. Now, the interesting dynamic about agriculture is that we set some records here in the last um, year and a half with the amount of grain that we imported. Now, for an agriculture producing nation, 
to import grain into Queensland was never seen before at the volumes that we saw before. And we were importing that grain as stock feed. Uh, so the drought meant that there wasn't enough feed for the cattle, etc. And uh, we had to set up a, a coastal shipping solution to import uh, around one and a half million tonne of grain last year uh, across the berth. Now in a normal year, we would export around 900,000 tonne of grain. Here we are importing one and a half million. We now hit um, COVID-19 measures. That has an impact on the ability for people to produce, uh, has, an, has an effect on demand and uh, has an effect on global demand as well. So a lot of dynamics at play to make sure that harvest in October and onwards uh, gets to its market and gets to it efficiently and cost effectively and is able to cope with the issues that are or the hurdles uh, put in front of us by uh, the coronavirus outbreak. So um, we're, we're happy to, to try and work more closely with the agriculture sector but one of the things that we're very keen to see is some rail movement for the grain sector. Um, for many years now um, our uh, cargo on rail has diminished to the point where only two percent of our cargo moves by rail. We are 100%, uh, 98% road dominated for all of our import and export movements. If we can come up with some rail solutions, and we're working with a number of operators to try and make that happen, we think we can get a better modal balance and a better supply chain cost outcome for the, for the sector to enable them to get their product to market. Um, and that is just using the current rail um, infrastructure. Um, we would like to see infrastructure and, uh, investment in an all up rail solution as part of the inland rail network. And of course, um, many of you will have heard us talk before about the need to connect inland rail to the port, that uh, stopping at Acacia Ridge doesn't make sense. And uh, there is indeed a, a study um, announced in November last year by the federal government, a uh, $20 million study to look at the business plan and, uh, and the uh, potential uh, corridors to get a dedicated rail solution uh, for the longer term. But in the short term, we do have rail connection. There is some capacity. We should explore how we can uh, use that to get a better outcome for the agriculture sector. Thanks, Peter. And, and I don't know if you have, if you can sort of make any, any more comments for, for those in the audience that, that might not know where the Inland Rail project is, is up to. Do, do, do you have an, a, um, could you maybe just fill us in a little bit on, on where that's at and, and that, that piece and sort of timeframes that you're sort of seeing? Yeah, sure, Stephen. So, so Inland Rail uh, announced uh, or re-announced, I should say, in 2013, uh, at the time by uh, Anthony Albanese actually, uh, but certainly taken forward by all of the gov federal government since and uh, significant amounts of investment. Now at the time uh, when the inland rail concept of building a rail highway between Melbourne and Brisbane, um, it was estimated to be a $10 billion infrastructure investment required. And very simply that was 1700 kilometres of rail. Now that's using current and new corridors, new rail, standard and narrow gauge in Queensland, um, all the way to Acacia Ridge. Now at the time it was contemplated to go to the port and in simple terms, that $10 billion became $13 billion back in that era. So for the extra 38 kilometers, $3 billion wasn't seen as, the, as a, a positive um, cost benefit ratio. However, we've successfully been able to uh, prosecute a case that it just doesn't make sense to stop short if you've got product in, in regions such as uh, the southwestern uh, downs, uh, the eastern downs, um, you know, places like Roma, Gundawindi, Thalam, where a lot of the agriculture sector has product for the market, then you should be able to get it to the port in a efficient and cost effective manner. So we've been able to um, uh, uh, lobby, if you like, but um, we also invested in a number of corridor studies to try and find out how we can build that section. Where we're at today is you'll see a lot of um, uh, information in the media about the uh, current federal government 
reviewing corridors, particularly here in Queensland, uh, across the Condamine uh, Plain. Uh, they are um, looking at all of the other uh, sections of inland rail with the st state and federal government signing the intergovernment agreement earlier this year to enable that to, to now progress. So it's, it is well progressed in the study phase. Um, build phase will follow that. Even with the best intent, inland rail is probably the best part of 10 years away from being operational all the way to the port. To Acacia Ridge, probably earlier. But now is the time to actually join the dots, join the thinking and, uh, and make that additional investment to get the maximum benefit out of that rail corridor for both domestic freight and for international freight to be able to get to market. And, um, you know, a lot of the benefits, moving the trucks off the road, it's not about, <clears throat> this is not a negative story about trucks. This is about modal balance. Um, obviously, trucking is very important for the uh, other, uh, other products and end-to-end -end solutions, connecting rail to the final destination. But uh, we need to get better modal balance. We can't just keep investing in our road work and hope that we'll solve the problem. Because even with normal growth, uh, you will see truck numbers double within 10 years and triple within 15. And that, in anybody's books, is not sustainable when you look at the road network. So now is the time to invest. And again, the private sector um, stands ready to work with government on finding that solution. Yeah, thanks, Peter. That's that's you know, it's it's such a um, it's it's a project that's been spoken about for for many years. So thanks for bringing people up to speed on on that. Um, look, there's a few questions coming through, Carl and, and Peter. So I'll try and start moving on to some of these. While while you're you're speaking, Peter and Carl, just a question on a no, on notice around domestic and and sort of movements of freight around Australia. I'll, I'll keep that because that'll come to you and you and Peter in a moment. But Peter, a question from Tim Ryan, just talking about, um, he's heard about large amounts of Europe, Asia, US to Asia liner blank sailings. Have you seen these sort of flow on effects for the Brisbane port activity or have there been many blank sailings on the Australia Asia routes? We, we obviously saw one vessel um, almost lose some of its cargo the other day coming, coming down the coast, but um, yeah, any blank sailings coming through? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, that vessel, the APL England, we've got here in, in port at the moment, My uh, one of my current headaches, but, uh, and it did indeed lose some cargo over the side. Um, and and the circumstances were, were um, natural causes from, from heavy seas and uh, loss of propulsion and steerage. Would have been a very scary event for the crew on that ship. Uh, and indeed, we, we are providing port of refuge and helping them to uh, recover from that. Blank sailings did occur from China. Uh, they did, uh, blank sailings are when they cancel services. Um, it's an industry um, uh, phrase, a blank sailing is a, is a nice way to say that the ship service has been canceled, uh, a bit like in the airline uh, sector when they cancel a flight. We, we saw a lot from China. We saw some from Southeast Asia, um, particularly when Korea was affected. In the um, north-south routes from Europe and the US, we're not seeing so many blank sailings because most of those are transshipped through ports like Singapore and Tianjin Palapas. But what we are seeing is huge congestion in ports like Singapore and Tianjin, uh, mainly because of workforce issues, um, congestion because ships are full and not able to get into ports that may be closed, um, a lot of dynamics that are affecting uh, the scheduling more so than the cancellation of services now. So we're seeing most ships off schedule. Uh, they are, they're struggling with, with ports like Singapore to get through uh, the queue. And uh, so cargo from Europe and US is indeed delayed, uh, more so than cancelled. Um, but volumes are down on the back of demand. So, so that's also um, uh, demand is, is very low and as such the, the volume of cargo is down at the moment. Fantastic, great, great question, uh, Tim. And look, moving on, Carl, a question that came from, from James Kurtz, it was to, to both of you, but I'll start with you, Carl. Um, you know, obviously we, there's still domestic flights moving around, around Australia. Um, 
I, I live on the north side of Brisbane and still seeing planes in the air. Um, all, all good, very high level, no noise from my place. But, um, you know, from the perspective of, of the movement of, of domestic passengers and I guess domestic freight, has there been any sort of uptick for Brisbane Airport with respect to domestic uh, movements of freight at all? Uh, yeah, I think it's reflective of, well, it's reflective of two things. I think um, there has, well, I think every, everything's relative with the uptick these days. Again, when, um, when, when you're 90% down. So to be, as I said, every flight is very welcome at Brisbane Airport. Um, but what, what I would say, I think two, two really positive initiatives from the federal government, the, um, the support of a, um, an ongoing network for Qantas and Virgin domestically that plays the dual role of continuing to move freight between states um, and also uh, passengers uh, for repatriation. So that's been a really important part of the Brisbane airport business um, and other airports. So those flights that uh, fly over your house, Stephen, and others, um, that's, that's an ongoing uh, um, network of domestic services. So there's, there's over 80 frequencies a week from both Qantas and Virgin that continue to fly those. Um, obviously, the, the, the other airlines, like Sub Alliance, uh, Rex and others, uh, also continue those flights. So we are seeing a definite um, continuation of those flights and in some cases an increase in business. So whilst a lot of areas have dried up dramatically, that these areas continue to, to flow. Um, and as the um, federal government and the, the additional uh, airline services that we're getting um, beyond the, 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 the IFAM program, um, it's important that when those freighters arrive, whether it's to us, um, Cairns, um, Wellcamp, Brisbane, uh, sorry, Melbourne or Sydney, there's still a need to, to dis dis distribute that, that freight and those goods around. Um, so um, I think whilst 90% down, the domestic flows are really continuing and positive and are critical to our business. Um, and they, they provide a really good platform for what comes next as well, because without those flows, it's going to be harder for the international flights that come in and vice versa. And Peter, from your perspective, um, and any changes to trans shipping at the moment across Australia? Stephen, we're not really seeing too many changes in the dynamics of, of shipping at the moment. It's, it's pretty much um, business as usual with the dynamics of ships being off schedule, um, Cargo volume has been a bit depressed. Um, Multi-speed in some other sectors. Um, we're also seeing some interesting dynamics, for example, in the fuel sector, uh, whereby demand has been depressed because everyone's been at home with their cars parked in the garage. But also we've got a refinery closed down at the moment. So uh, they're doing their refit, uh, which timing wise is probably um, quite uh, elegant um, in that uh, demand is depressed. But uh, we're seeing things like um, tank capacity for fuel uh, being under pressure because a lot of the tankage here in Brisbane is full of avgas. And of course, you don't you need that when you've got planes flying. And if you've only got 10% of or thereabouts of planes flying, then avgas stocks are, are taking up valuable tankage. So there's a lot of dynamics that when you drill down to each commodity, they've got their own set of um, hurdles and challenges, and uh, hence our, our job is to be try to work with each sector to see how we can um, help them through that, through birth allocation, scheduling, etc., um, in order to prioritise what we need to get to the consumer at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, it gets very complex when you start diving into each uh, commodity because each one's been affected in a different way. Yeah, I, I mean, it's always it's always fascinating talking to you, Peter, around the the nuance of all these different uh, of freights and cargo. Um, it, it, you know, I just uh, rock up to my store, find something, buy it, and you you, you know, a lot of us don't don't fully appreciate um, what goes into that supply chain. Look, there's a question that I think one of the first questions on on the list was from Morton, and it was around e-commerce. Um, but I'll also, I'll also add that into a question from Jared as well. So the, the general, general question is uh, just around e-commerce and is, is, the, is e-commerce impacting uh, freight flows at the moment through BAC? Is, it sort of, is there more, more domestic freight coming in, uh, more international freight coming in on some of these flights? And, and I guess the second question, um, just to lead into that, and I'll start with Carl on this one, but it's just about 
this freight and are, are we going to see any any shifts or changes in those supply chains where typically sort of air freight might be moving to the sea cargo or, or vice versa so i'll start with you carl maybe touch on the the e-commerce and any any sort of impacts you're seeing there from imports exports and then we'll pick up the topic around um, modal splits and changes potentially moving forward in supply chains so yeah sure you, carl. I'd say, well, I think there's been an, there's been a trend over recent years, and um, as we've all started to uh, purchase more things online, and and the likes of Amazon and um, and others uh, uh, increase their business and those flows. So it's definitely part of the lifeblood of our, our business. Um, but there's been a steady crease in, in in recent years, and I'd say in the last two months of lockdown, I, I can certainly attest for a lot of the BAC staff. There's been a huge spike in uh, online shopping. Um, but but as a proportion of the, the the absolute tonnage of what we're seeing to date, it hasn't it hasn't taken over as 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 a, as a significant proportion. We still have, you know, the majority of our, our throughput tends to be um, obviously as a lot of people on this call and in industry, uh, you know, chilled beef, the, the agriculture, fresh produce, uh, seafood, um, amongst other uh, items. So it's definitely there and increasing. Um, I think it will be really interesting for the future um, as to um, the recovery. I wouldn't say a reset, but what the 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 challenges that the the, um, the the retail stores and the others are having, and all those all, all, all the, um, the 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 tough news we see with certain certain stores closing and, and companies um, online seems to be accelerating um, as a as a well, it's certainly playing a greater role now. But in the future, I think I think it potentially has a, a bigger role to play. Um, as to the modal, um, I think for us, uh, I think I've seen a couple of questions along this. So I, I don't envisage a world where freighters or dedicated freighters, when we do hit recovery and over the next four, four or five years, playing um, too much more of a greater role. I think the reality for the Brisbane size of city, the industry, 80% um, of our, our current freight um, goes, goes in the belly of passenger aircraft. So the airline economics um, will we'll speak to that, um, as opposed to a, um, a, a Frankfurt or a, a Kentucky where, where the predominantly freight hubs. Uh, so I think that proportion will continue. Um, one thing that the airlines have made really clear in these times, well, they make it generally, but in these times, freight plays an incredibly important role in their profitability of routes. So my comments earlier about us working together identifying the demand and really providing that information again to the freight forwarders but also to the airlines to say there is export potential here there are there are um, there's a greater opportunity for us to move more freight will play a really important role of us not only getting our flights back but getting them back faster and accelerating that growth from a three a week to a five a week to a seven a week and more um, the more that um, the industry governments um, we all work together to help us convey to airlines that there is stronger demand to give them confidence to put put flights back and also sustain flights. I think will help all of us. So, uh, as I said, I don't see freighters taking over. Um, they, they may continue to play a, a smaller role, but it, but it's really the, the the freight will continue to or the exports will continue to move in the belly of passenger aircraft, um, both domestically, um, well, internationally for sure. Domestically, yes, but uh, there's an important role for the domestic Fridays in particular to continue what doing what they're doing. And I think um, just just adding to that, um, Carl, just a question that, that I had and, and maybe the audience might have as well. I mean, when you talk about a typical passenger flight, when it's a uh, you know normal operating with with passengers on top, I mean, how much how much cargo can can a, a passenger flight take? I mean, how many how many kilos roughly are we talking? Yeah. So, so at the moment, um, the, the well, well uh, without passengers, up to fifteen to twenty tons um, is what's talked about through the IFAM program and, and with airlines. So that's obviously significant volumes of, uh, of fresh produce and others. So that's the starting point um, when there's, there's there's either dedicated freighters or, or wide body passenger aircraft that's with no passengers. Um, but again, depending on the the type of aircraft, the size, I mean, that can that can halve or, or less in terms of um, space for, for for luggage and others. So so um, yeah, it's more so now. But in the future, um, anywhere between twenty and forty percent can be um, um, freight in the belly of aircraft. So the more freight that we have, the more of those passengers type aircraft, and we'll get the benefit of both visitors 
and goods and services moving um, in and out of our in and out of city. Yeah, fantastic. And and I mean, Peter, just to put that in into context, I mean, some of the some of the vessels that are coming into Brisbane with, um, you know, some of the big big vessels that we can handle. I mean, just roughly, how much does a a big vessel take these days from the perspective of of tonnage? Yeah, Stephen. So it is interesting um, the dynamics of freight. So air freight plays a, a, a vital role when it comes to perishables or urgent componentry, uh, mail, etc. Um, but sea freight carries the, the bigger load, obviously. And when we talk about um, an aircraft, 15 to 20 ton, well, that's a 20 foot container uh, here. And put that in perspective, we do 1.3 million. 20, uh, equivalent of 20 foot containers a year. So a ship, uh, uh, you know, the one we've got in the moment that we, we're, we're rescuing, it's a 5,000 TEU ship. So it's got the equivalent of, of 5,000 containers on it. Um, not all with freight, but majority with freight. Um, so what passes through here tends to be the, the long run inventories, um, the stuff that you would buy at a Bunnings or a Kmart, that they have a lot of inventory on them. Going to the e-commerce question, it's been a really interesting dynamic, talking to some of the customers about the frustrations of, of people buying online. So for example, doing a click and collect, but then they find there's no stock uh, because it was caught up in the, in the China backlog. And uh, it'll take two weeks to sell from China. Uh, yet some of the analogies they've told us, well, it's actually starting to become faster during this this um, COVID problem because of air freight being so uh, restricted, it's faster to come from China than it is to come from Melbourne. But um, <clears throat> generally speaking, um, the dynamic of the, the global inventories is, is really quite interesting. So here's an example. Um, Hyundai weren't able to bring any vehicles out. Hyundai were made predominantly in Korea. That, that's where they're assembled. They only need one or two components made in China and they couldn't make a car. So they had to shut their factory down while, while China was in shut. And that played out in things like washing machines, breezes. You only need one part of that washing machine made in China and it couldn't move. And uh, we saw a lot of that happening as well, where there's a lot of uh, backlog of freight uh, waiting for China to come back on board to get into manufacturing to supply other Asian nations with their components and vice versa. China then got caught in the, well, I can't produce this because a certain part's made in Japan and now they're in lockdown. Lots of stories like that, that created that clunkiness in the supply chain and therefore e-commerce has been a mixed bag of experiences for the consumer uh, where, you know, why am I waiting two weeks or three weeks for the product I ordered online uh, versus I, I ordered it today and I got it tomorrow. Um, but I do think it'll change the dynamic of how we shop going forward and that will play its part in the supply chain. And I do believe it'll actually put more emphasis on air freight uh, because of that consumer need to have it today uh, rather than wait two or three weeks. So, I mean, just coming, sort of summarising that point, because I know this was <clears throat> sort of Jared, Jared Huntley's question, but your, you know, that premium product that, um, you know, a, a product that has, um, you know, uh, some semblance of, of needing to get to market relatively quickly, perishable, seems to, we still believe that will uh, still suit air freight and air freight will still be an important part of that. And then for you, Peter, with the port, that supply chain that's doing obviously cars and vehicles and, and some of those bigger commodities, that, that sort of non-perishable piece is, is going to continue to stay on, on that, that piece. I guess this is a question that came through from Floyd for, uh, and it was addressed to Carl, but I think it's probably applicable for both of you. But, um, you know, to Carl first on, on Floyd's question, uh, he was asking the question around uh, what measures because of COVID um, and practical measures are BAC taking to support the manual transfer of goods at the airport from the, the, the aircraft to the warehouse? Um, you know, and, and probably a question for you, Peter, that you, you, you sort of touched on a little bit, but maybe let's expand on that a bit. Are there, what, have, what have been some of the challenges for you around that because of COVID and the, the health issues there? Yeah, for us um, and, and across the business, um, one of our key values and, and companies certainly have, you know, 
a range of values, but it's something we take very, very seriously. It's the safety of our employees, stakeholders, passengers, everybody part of the business. Apologies, it's a uh, firearm. Actually, maybe Peter, if you want to go first, well, uh, well, you deal with your alarm. Well, well, I deal with my, uh, my my little distraction. Sure, happy to. Um, look, it was interesting. Um, so let's let's just talk about China as the example. It takes around twelve to thirteen days for a ship to sail from China. However, um, your quarantine period is about fourteen days, as as we know from all of the health advisories. Now, other countries are much closer. So somewhere like Taiwan might be eight days to, to get to port. So how did we uh, manage that through the government agencies such as Border Force, uh, Health, um, both state and federal, to come up with a way to ensure that the supply chain didn't become uh, locked down by this 14 day quarantine period. And, and look, the winners are the importers and exporters. We've been able to get the ships in. Um, Unfortunately, the losers are the crew on the ship and, and my heart goes out to them. They're the ones who suffer the 14 day quarantine rule where the crew have to stay on board. They do segregate from the stevedores that go on board and there are a number of health measures around protecting those stevedores to ensure there's no cross contamination. And, uh, and they involve all of the standard um, measures that we see now with physical distancing, um, masks for the crew, um, hand wash, etc. But that enables ships to get through, but the crew on the ship are stuck on the ship. And that is a, an ongoing problem that still needs resolution because some of these crew on the, on the international ships would traditionally do nine to 10 months on board, would you believe, uh, uh, before they have some months off. Now they're, they're staring down the barrel of being on that ship for 12 plus months. And that's not, um, that's sustainable for them so there are there are there is work in progress at the moment to try and help those crew as to how we can do crew changes. Very hard without international flights, of course, uh, but um, we're trying to work as best we can with all of the agencies, uh, the unions, the ITFs, to see what we can do to help crew. Cargo has been able to flow because of all the other measures that we put in, and therefore the supply chain has been efficient and effective in getting stuff to the shop shelves at the end of the day. All right, thank um, you, Carl, if you're solved. <laughs> yep. Sorry, no. Carl, oh, so, sorry, Stephen, I just had a quick question for Carl um, on whether or not there's been any particular air carriers that have been showing leadership in the space of working with airport to provide cost-effective and cost-efficient solutions for uh, our customers wanting to export uh, globally. Yeah, and, and that's something, you know, when we, um, freight's always been an important part of our business, but in terms of this heightened interest given um, the drying up of the supply and demand um, of, of the export opportunity. So as airline air capacity disappeared, um, access to markets disappeared, um, there was a comment, there was a question earlier about, um, have we seen the shift from international to domestic? So yes, all that's occurred. Um, where, what we're left with is uh, supply and demand um, there's the shortages in that in that supply chain. So um, as as that capacity has dried up, costs have definitely gone up. Um, so so again, what we, I mean, the two main challenges I, I see, and, and what we're really keen to work, it's not it's not you know Brisbane Airport will play the role, and we're very keen to work with everybody. Um, but when the airlines ask us, um, what's the demand that you see? How can you help us plan and hopefully introduce more flights? Um, exporters wanting to move that. The reality, when you lose 90% of that capacity, the costs have gone up. So the two things that we're really keen to do is help coordinate the exchange of information. So what is the full demand capacity? If there's a need to help try and consolidate and aggregate that demand, if we can put 15 to 20 tonnes on, an, on a wide body international flight, that will lower the costs uh, somewhat rather than it going out with only 10 tonnes. Um, there is still that price differential and the model that the federal government through the IFAM, the International Freight Assistance Mechanism, I think has been great. So that's only $110 million for nationwide, but that cost, that funding has helped address the, fund, the gap, the cost gap. So they haven't funded flights fully, they've just really addressed what's market value and where has the gap been. Um, so that's the challenge for us as, as Brisbane and as a, as a, as a, um, as a collective. Um, the airlines are running without passengers, so there's a shortfall for them. So how do we provide as much information, as much 
opportunity for the exports to fill the flights. Um, and then working amongst with industry ourselves, with marketing, um, the Queensland government is, you know, how do we, how do we address that cost gap? Um, yeah. um, because, you know, as I said before, the next six months are going to be critical for business survival, business revenue, jobs. Um, but if we do, if we can help address those two questions, that will lay a really strong platform for us to recover more quickly. Um, that, not only in the next six months, but into 2021 and beyond. Does that come down to a more collaborative effort between Brisbane Airport and other regional centres and cities that, that um, have international channels out of Australia as well? Potentially, I'd say twofold. I think number one, though, I think is is Brisbane our community and everybody on this uh, webinar, um, Brisbane marketing government. How do we do the best job we can as Brisbane to to maximise the flows and work together? Um, and I'd say yes uh, in the future. I know uh, you know we have many discussions whether we're, whether from a tourism perspective or, or, or freight and exports with the likes of say Cairns and Cairns Airport and the tourism. Um, you know, if we if we generate say enough demand for ten extra flights on, with the exports, but there's half a flight left and there's half 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 a flight worth of uh, seafood out of Cairns, there is the opportunity, perhaps um, you know Brisbane, Brisbane Cairns Hong Kong, which which is one of the IFAM flights at the moment. So how do we look at perhaps both of those? Because I think we need to be mature. We need to work together both as Brisbane to maximise ours but be open to work with, with um, other stakeholders as well. Fantastic. And, and we're sort of, we're getting a bit short of, short of time um, here, Doug. I, I might just take one, I might use my role as MC to just put one more question to, to Carl and Peter. Um, but um, just uh, Peter and Carl, from the perspective of your own businesses, what, uh, what indicators are you looking to um, to see the recovery. So Peter, you talked about the fact that, um, you know, from the ports perspective, you're seeing indicators that maybe get ahead of some of the economic forecasts that economists may have. But for both of you, and I'll start with you, Peter, what are some of those indicators that you're, you're looking to, to help you sort of plan your business and, and look to that recovery? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I'll keep it as brief as I can. Our indicators are mainly focused on infrastructure spend. So, so we really want to see um, a change in the thinking um, around the, you know, instead of saying why we can't build something, we should be saying, how can we build that? And we shouldn't just look at it for five years, we should look at it for 50 years when we're assessing the business case. If we're going to stimulate the economy, we've got to get some infrastructure going. We've got to get behind a number of sectors, um, including Yes, there is a need for renewable energy, so things like wind farms and solar, but we need to also be realistic. And the reality is that transition will take some time. So we've got to support our coal sector as well. Queensland is a resource state based on coal, CSG, LNG and agriculture. And uh, products like meat, I mean, our meat exporters have, uh, are doing it tough from the drought. Now we've got the China issues going on. We've somehow got to get behind them and support them as well. Um, when we talk about coal, we need to get this red tape out of the way and move forward. And I'm pleased to see some government announcements about new coal mines. To get out of this recession, we've got to create jobs. And to create jobs, we've got to get behind each of those sectors. And we've got to cut through some of the noise and some of the red tape and get these projects moving much faster than what we have in the past. Otherwise, will be with the rest of the world in a longer term recession. We have the ability to get out of it by uh, what we've shown in the last couple of months, our ability to be collaborative and to be fast moving. And I think we've got to continue that pace. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Peter. And Carl, from your perspective? Yeah, just quickly, I, th I think ours is a, a little bit different view. We're doing all the things that we should be in terms of keeping our eye on um, the trends and updates. But uh, our recovery is very much tied to um, obviously border border uh, restrictions, both domestically uh, to New Zealand. We talk of the trans bubble and then eventual international. So without those, there's really a limited ability for airlines to really open up and obviously passenger flows, but even greater export flows as as we get our that 90% level of flights that we've lost, that will really accelerate. So, um, I mean, just a broad update, I don't know, there's a question on the Trans-Tasman. We're hoping and looking 
um, at a domestic recovery from between July and September and then from there. Obviously a lot of work to do and, and our team has a number of fo focuses in terms of working with government, border agencies, health, um, um, the airlines and obviously the border restrictions are key of that. Translate that to the Trans-Tasman in New Zealand, absolutely the same. There's a lot of our work that our team is doing with all those border agencies and government and the airlines. Um, but being ready and to Peter's point, being nimble. And then same with international. And, and again, it won't be all international countries at once. It, it might be a select few of countries that have also done a good job. Um, so there's talk of bubbles, you know, the Trans-Tasman bubble, maybe some bubbles with some other countries. But just being ready well ahead of that and accelerating from there. Um, and obviously working really closely with our airlines. So one key positive I just want to finish with is we obviously have Qantas, Virgin, um, we have webs, the likes of many carriers, Singapore, Emirates, but Qatar also operating six weeks of flights. The airlines that are investing here are, is a good sign. So if we're able to support and work with them to throw freight and various things, that, that will continue to help our progress and momentum. So that would be my last point, that if we can work with our airlines to give them confidence to continue to invest in our market and, and in a sustained way, that will help us both in exports, but also opening up our, uh, our broader economy and, and, and uh, borders as well. Fantastic. Look, thanks, thanks, Carl and Peter. And before I hand back to Doug, just thank you for your for your comments, for your openness today. We acknowledge that we we haven't covered every, uh, I guess, burning question that that people may have out there, and uh, this will be a, a continuing uh, conversation. And we're happy to dive into uh, more and more of this this content from Brisbane Marketing's perspective. Just speaking to e-commerce and the e-commerce question, uh, the the Morton placed earlier. We are talking with eBay and Amazon and looking at how we can get, get connected in with them a little bit more and, and look to that a little bit more as well. But um, I'll, I'd echo Carl's comments. This is a, a collaborative um, recovery process. This is, uh, you know, local government, state government, federal government working together with, you know, private sector, investors, industry and, and our key assets and key infrastructure to to get this recovery going. And I think if anyone is well placed to do it, Southeast Queensland and Queensland is. So um, thank you again for, for speaking and I'll hand over to Doug to, to wrap out for us. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, before we go, I just wanted to have a quick flying minute. There's been a bit of discussion around e-commerce uh, in today's uh, webinar. And I, I, I got pretty excited yesterday when I saw a link from our, um, our next guest, Mike Doyle, who's the head of consumer marketing for Brisbane Airport Corporation. There's a link for 50% off Ugg boots, would you believe? So those those people who are on the webinar uh, this afternoon better better get in quick. I think they'll sell pretty quickly. Mike, how how has B&E Marketplace uh, launched, and 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 how's it going? Well, thanks for having me. Um, well, it launched with uh, very little fanfare, in, in amongst all of the other things that were happening within the market. We went from what you would consider a traditional um, airport retail offering uh, with passengers coming through and shopping in the terminal, um, much like a Westfield, to something that resembles um, nothing like that, probably the only way you could describe it. Um, so Martin Ryan, who's the, the general manager of the consumers group, had a pretty good online experience. He flew over to Hawaii, came back, got uh, locked in his house, uh, as the isolation rules would dictate, um, and just turned to me and said, we need to we need to support our tenants. Um, what can we do? And we came up with the idea of releasing a marketplace. So, um, pretty simple to run up an e-commerce solution these days. Uh, immensely more complicated to do a marketplace, but we chose the uh, the harder of the two paths um, and started uh, about 16 days after the initial idea was posed. Um, and we are still trading. So we've we've done. Well over six figures, close, closing on seven in terms of the throughput, um, which puts a small dent in a rather large stock holding for some of our, our tenants on airport. Um, but it's proof that that kind of activity is certainly possible um, given the technology that's available in the market. So going great guns so far, obviously navigating some of the challenges that um, a fledgling uh, e-commerce platform would always have. Um, but the benefit is that most of the technology um, that was available to us is available to everybody on this call. Um, so it just takes a little bit of courage to to step into that space and, and give it a go. Fantastic, Mike. And look, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to go and uh, check out b &E Marketplace. It's a great initiative from Brisbane Airport. Thanks very much, Mike, for coming in briefly on that uh, 
uh, on the webinar this afternoon. I just want to say thank you to, uh, to Carl, Peter, uh, Stephen, special thanks to you, mate, for um, moderating and facilitating the discussion here this afternoon. It's been fantastic. Um, we've had 170 people register for today's webinar, which just proves that there, there are plenty of people, there are plenty of businesses uh, and industry representatives, um, as well as government, who are keen to engage um, and, and collaborate to, to create solutions moving forward so we can grow our global exports. Um, over the next 24 hours, I'm going to be uh, posting a um, link to a replay of this webinar that we've had this afternoon, as well as a survey that we would love for everyone to, to, to fill out and provide us with feedback. Um, we're endeavouring to have a, another webinar session in the next quarter. Um, and the focus of that webinar essentially comes down to the feedback we get from the attendees today through that survey. So we encourage everyone to get on board, um, provide us with some suggestions around themes and topics that we can explore and, um, and we can take it from there. Um, thanks again, everyone, for being a part of this discussion this afternoon. Really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to catch up with everybody soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> thanks, Doug. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Doug. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Take care.